Today's video is brought to you by HelloFresh. Honestly, who's got the time to cook a full meal from scratch anymore? After a full day of work, nobody wants to spend hours preparing a meal. Unfortunately, the other options can be tricky too. Eating out, still a bit dicey. Delivery, lots of fees, not super healthy. Well, fortunately, HelloFresh is the perfect solution that checks every box. It's going to help you try something that's fresh and adventurous. It's also affordable, convenient, and environmentally conscious. And you can do it all from the comfort of your own home. Yes, with HelloFresh, you get a specially designed five-star meal kit that's going to break you out of that recipe rut. They work with local farmers to send you delicious, locally sourced meals that can help you skip the meal prep and put dinner on the table in 30 minutes or less. HelloFresh is a perfect service because of its flexibility, but also because of its responsible business model. If you like variety, you're never locked in to any option. Change your preference for a week if you want some spontaneity, or add in some extra meals or proteins, whatever you like. And of course, HelloFresh makes it easy to support them by making virtually everything recyclable, sustainable, and of course, sanitized. Right now, you can go to HelloFresh.com and use the code BRAINFOOD16 to get 16 free meals and 3 surprise gifts, plus free shipping. Again, 16 free meals, 3 surprise gifts with the code BRAINFOOD16 at HelloFresh.com. And now today's video. In the cantina scene of 1977's Star Wars, smuggler Han Solo famously boasts that his ship, the Millennium Falcon, did the Kessel Run in less than 12 parsecs. In the decade since the film's release, fans and detractors alike have pointed out that Han's boast is nonsensical, as a parsec is a unit of distance, not time. Writer-director George Lucas has claimed that his gaffe was intentional, meant to indicate that, quote, Han was something of a bull artist who didn't always know precisely what he was talking about. Conversely, the 2018 film Solo, a Star Wars story, retcons the line by showing Han taking a shorter but more dangerous route through hyperspace. But pedantic nitpicks of a 45-year-old space opera aside, what exactly is a parsec, and how do astronomers go about measuring the vast distances separating stars, galaxies, and other objects in the universe? The term parsec, coined by British astronomer Herbert Hall Turner in 1913, is a contraction of parallax seconds and refers to the stellar parallax parallax method used by astronomers to measure the distance to stars. Parallax is the apparent shift in position of an object as the observer changes their vantage point. The greater the distance, the smaller the parallax shift, an effect easily observable by looking out of the window at a moving vehicle. Closer objects appear to move more quickly, while those on the horizon barely seem to move at all. To determine the distance to a star using parallax, an astronomer must first measure the position of the star while the Earth is on one side of the Sun. The astronomer then waits half a year until the Earth is on the other side of the Sun, then measures the position of the star again. These measurements produce a right triangle, with one side being the distance from the Earth to the Sun, and the base angle being the difference between the two stellar position measurements. Using trigonometry, the remaining side of the triangle can be solved to give the distance to the star. In astronomy, celestial navigation and other fields where angular measurements tend to be much smaller than a standard degree, scientists divide angles into minutes of arc or arc minutes equal to 1 60th of a degree, and seconds of an arc into arc seconds equal to 1 60th of an arc minute, or 1 3600th of a degree. A parsec is defined as the distance over which an object will experience a parallax shift of one arc second, approximately 30.9 trillion kilometers. As the parsec is based on a practical measurement technique, astronomers tend to prefer it to the more popular unit of light year, defined as the distance that light travels through a vacuum in one year, or approximately 9.46 6 trillion kilometers. Like the Parsec and the Quantum Leap, which is actually an extremely short distance, the light year is also widely misunderstood and abused in pop culture, as evidenced by the common claim that a certain product or company is light years ahead of the competition. As you might have noticed, measuring the distance to a celestial object using parallax requires knowing the distance between the Earth and the Sun, the so-called astronomical unit, or AU. But how is this value determined? While in more recent years, the positions of the planets in the solar system have been accurately fixed using space probes, radar, and telemetry, in the past, measuring the AU involved making careful observations of a rare celestial phenomenon known as a transit of Venus. In 1663, Scottish mathematician James Gregory suggested 
suggested that the transit of the planets Venus or Mercury along the disk of the Sun could theoretically be used to determine the distance between the Earth and the Sun. His ideas were further refined in 1716 by British astronomer Edmund Halley, after whom the famous comet is named. The basic idea was for astronomers at sites around the globe to measure the time it took for Venus to cross the solar disk. As each observer would observe the Sun from different angles, Venus would appear to transit the disk at different locations and thus take different amounts of time to cross. Comparing the transit time between two observation sites would produce a parallax angle, while distance between those sites would form one side of a right triangle, which, as in the solar parallax method, could easily be solved to yield the distance between the Earth and the Sun. But there was a problem. In 1639, British astronomer Jeremiah Horrocks, building on the work of German astronomer Johannes Kepler, determined that transits of Venus were exceedingly rare events, occurring in pairs eight years apart every 121.5 and 105.5 years. Predicting that such an event would occur that very same year, Horrocks set up a simple telescope to project an image of the Sun onto a piece of paper and observe the transit of Venus on the 4th of December 1639. His observations, crude as they were, allowed him to estimate the distance between the Earth and the Sun to be about 95.6 million kilometers, around 70% of the currently accepted value. A more accurate figure, however, would require more precise measurements by multiple observers, as in Gregory and Halley's method. Unfortunately, there were no transits during either man's lifetimes, with the next one predicted to occur in 1761 and 1769. Thankfully, by this time, the scientific community was more than ready, and as the date of the next transit approached, dozens of countries dispatched astronomers to hundreds of sites around the globe in one of history's first truly international scientific undertakings. France sent a full 32 observers, and Britain 18, including astronomer and surveyor Charles Mason, who, along with Jeremiah Dixon, would later survey the famous Mason-Dixon line, separate the North and Southern United States. The project, however, quickly turned into a debacle as astronomers encountered countless obstacles, including travel delays, bad weather, and hostile locals. On the way to their observation site in Sumatra, Mason and Dixon's ship was attacked by a French frigate, forcing them to divert to South Africa. Their observations, spoiled by cloud cover, proved inconclusive, as did those of fellow Englishman Neville Maskelyne, based on the Atlantic island of St. Helena. But unluckiest of all were the French. Jean Schapp spent months traveling across the Siberian wilderness by coach, boat, and sleigh, only for his progress to be halted by swollen rivers. The superstitious locals were quick to blame Schapp and his strange astronomical instruments for the unusually heavy spring rains, and he was chased out of Siberia without ever observing the transit. Meanwhile, Guillaume Le Gentil made an equally arduous journey to India, only to arrive late and miss the 1761 transit. Undaunted, Le Gentil spent the next eight years building a state-of-the-art observatory in Pondicherry in anticipation of the 1769 transit. But in a cruel twist of fate, when the day at last arrived, a cloud slid in front of the sun and remained there for the entire 14 minutes, 7 second duration of the transit. Despondent, Le Gentil packed up and headed home, only to be laid up with dysentery for a year and nearly shipwrecked on the African coast. And when the luckless astronomer finally returned to France after eleven and a half years abroad, he discovered he had officially been declared dead, his wife had remarried, and his relatives had enthusiastically plundered his estate. And there you were, thinking that your life sucked. In the end, none of the expeditions sent to observe the 1761 transit returned any useful date, and it would fall to a then-obscure Royal Navy captain named James Cook to obtain the long-sought-after observations. On June 3, 1769, Cook, along with British naturalist Joseph Banks, British astronomer Charles Green, and Swedish naturalist Daniel Solander, observed the transit of Venus from a mountain on the island of Tahiti in the South Pacific. Their data allowed French astronomer Joseph Lalonde to calculate the distance between the Earth and the Sun as 150 50 million kilometers value later refined to 149.597 million kilometers. Astronomers finally had a yardstick by which to measure the rest of the universe. While powerful, the stellar parallax method requires the measurement of a minuscule change in position that can only be detected by sensitive telescopes. Indeed, for much of human history up to the Renaissance, the lack of observable stellar parallax was commonly used as an argument against a heliocentric or sun-centered universe. It was not until 1838 that German astronomer Friedrich Bessel finally succeeded in using parallax to measure the distance to the star 61 Cygni, which he calculated to be 3.5 parsecs or 33.1 trillion kilometers. The discovery shocked Bessel's fellow astronomers, who had previously believed stars to be much closer. Bessel would go on to calculate the distances to 3,200 
221 stars, greatly expanding our understanding of the visible universe. However, beyond around 100 parsecs, the distorting effects of the Earth's atmosphere make stellar parallax very difficult to measure using ground-based telescopes. Thus, until the development of Earth-orbiting satellites, objects beyond this distance could not be accurately measured using traditional techniques. A different method was needed. One such method, first proposed in the late 18th century by British astronomer William Herschel, is to use the apparent brightness of stars as a yardstick. The brightness of an object decreases with the square of its distance, the so-called inverse square law, meaning that an object three times further away will appear nine times dimmer. Thus, if one knows the actual brightness of an object and its apparent or observable brightness, one can easily calculate the distance. While simple in theory, Herschel's method had two major flaws. First, Stars vary wildly in their actual brightness, and second, Herschel did not know the actual brightness of any given star. His method should therefore have been useless, as it would be impossible to tell a dim, close object from a bright, distant object. Determined to get started on mapping the cosmos, however, Herschel made the practical, if erroneous, assumption that all stars had approximately the same brightness, and used the brightness of the star Sirius as a standard candle loft which to calibrate all his measurements. As the first measurement of stellar parallax would not be made until 16 years after Herschel's death, all of his distances were calculated in Syria meters, that is, multiples of the distance to Sirius rather than absolute units. Using the brightness method, Herschel and later astronomers were able to build a three-dimensional map of the observable universe and determine that all stars in the sky were concentrated in a flat, disc-shaped formation 10,000 light-years across and 1,000 light-years thick. This is what we now know as the Milky Way galaxy. For nearly a century following Herschel's death, astronomers believed that all stars in the universe were contained in the Milky Way, with the space beyond it being completely empty. This view, however, would be challenged in the early 20th century as astronomers began studying mysterious objects known as nebulas. Meaning cloud in Latin, nebulas have been observed since antiquity, but only started being closely studied and catalogued in the 18th century. Appearing as indistinct luminous blobs through the telescopes, nebulas were initially believed to be clouds of interstellar gas, hence the name. However, in 1845, William Parsons, the third Earl of Ross, built the largest telescope then in existence and used it to discover that the nebula known as M51 was in fact a spiral cluster of stars and entire galaxy onto itself. While Ross would go on to unmask dozens of so-called nebulas as galaxies, the scientific establishment was hesitant to accept his claims that these objects lay beyond the Milky Way, in an echo of the geocentric orthodoxies of the past, admitting that our home galaxy was but one of many scattered throughout the vastness of space, was seen as making the Earth and its place in the universe even less special. The astronomy community soon found itself divided into two major camps, one arguing that nebulas were separate, distinct galaxies, and the other that they were merely aberrant star clusters contained within the Milky Way. This schism culminated in a famous public debate between American astronomers Harlow Shapley and Heber Curtis. It was held at the National Academy of Sciences in Washington, D.C. on April 26, 1920. While both sides argued their case passionately, without an accurate means of measuring the distance to nebulas, the results of the so-called Great Debate were inconclusive. Thankfully, just such a method had been discovered some eight years before by a remarkable but unlikely researcher. By the early 20th century, the field of astronomy had been revolutionized by the development of photography. Photographs could now record objectively what had previously been filtered through the astronomer's subjective eye and memory, while long exposures could capture objects previously too faint to be seen with the naked eye. This new method generated copious amounts of photographic plates whose contents had to be measured, analyzed, and tabulated, a painstaking and often mind-numbing task that was largely delegated to armies of workers, mainly women, known as computers. Among these was Henrietta Swan Leavitt, who in 1903 was hired as a computer at the Harvard College Observatory under astronomer Charles Pickering. While computers were expected simply to crunch numbers and leave research to the real astronomers, in the course of poring over thousands of photographic plates, Leavitt soon noticed a pattern involving an unusual usual type of star called a Cepheid variable. Named after Delta Cephei, the first such star to be identified, Cepheid variables vary in brightness according to a regular predictable rhythm. At the time, it was not yet known what caused Cepheid variables to pulsate. In an attempt to find out, Levitt set out to 
find a correlation between the frequency of the stars and the only other data point available, their brightness. Unfortunately, she faced much the same problem as William Herschel had a century before. Without knowing the actual brightness of a Cepheid variable, it was impossible to tell a dim close star from a bright distant star. To get around this, Leavitt looked into the Magellanic Clouds, a pair of bright dwarf galaxies visible in the southern hemisphere. As the distances between the stars within the Magellanic Clouds were relatively much smaller than the distance between the clouds and Earth, the properties of any Cepheid variables within the clouds could be more or less directly compared. Over the next five years, Levitt identified some 1,770 Cepheid variables in the Magellanic Clouds and plotted their brightness against their frequency. To her astonishment, the data points fit perfectly along a logarithmic curve, indicating a direct physical relationship between frequency and brightness. This meant that if two stars had the same frequency, they also had the same actual brightness, allowing their relative distance from one another to be determined via Herschel's inverse square law method. In other words, Levitt had discovered a standard candle that could be used to measure even the most distant celestial objects. Levitt published her monumental findings in 1912 under the understated title Periods of 25 Variable Stars in the Small Magellanic Cloud. Like Herschel's method, Levitt's discovery could only give the relative distances between separate variables. In 1913, however, Danish astronomer A. N. R. Hertzsprung used stellar parallax to measure the absolute distance to several nearby Safford variables, providing a baseline for all of Levitt's observations. Ten years later, American astronomer Edwin Hubble identified a Cepheid variable in the Andromeda Nebula, and using Levitt's method, determined it to be a staggering 2.5 million light-years, or 770,000 parsecs away. This discovery put an end to the Great Debate, proving that once and for all nebulas like Andromeda are in fact distant, independent galaxies, and not a part of the Milky Way. In 1924, the Swedish Academy of Sciences began the process of nominating Henrietta Leavitt for the Nobel Prize in Physics, only to discover that she had died of stomach cancer three years before at the age of 53. As Nobel Prizes are not awarded posthumously, Leavitt was never formally honored for her groundbreaking discovery. Since Levitt's time, astronomers have discovered several other standard candles, including RR Lyra stars and Type 1a supernovae. With the advent of gravitational wave observatories, objects that produce larger, regular gravitational disturbances like binary neutron and black hole systems have also been proposed as standard sirens for distance measurements, the initial intensity of their gravitational waves being easily determined by the laws of gravitation and orbital mechanics. Using these and other methods as this writing, astronomers have been able to measure the distance to objects out to 13.4 billion light years, or 4.1 billion parsecs, a number that will continue to grow as time goes on. One day, perhaps astronomers may stumble upon a galaxy far, far away, where rebels are constantly fighting a galactic empire and roguish smugglers use parsecs as a unit of time. Or maybe not. Either way, I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, please do use that like button below. Don't forget to subscribe, and thank you for watching.